Chapter 1, The Road to Beaumont. I have always lived violently, drunk hugely, eaten too much or not at all, slept around the clock or missed two nights of sleeping, worked too hard and too long in glory, or slobbed for a time in utter laziness. I've lifted, pulled, chopped, climbed, made love with joy, and taken my hangovers as a consequence, not as a punishment. John Steinbeck travels with Charlie in search of America. There's no good way to meet a killer. That's not to say that I was worried about getting killed, merely that there's no good way to adequately prepare to sit down with someone about whom you've heard stories that involve them killing. And I don't mean killing in the war, although most certainly Robert Lee was involved with that in World War II. I mean the kind of killing that seems impossible to fathom in the modern world. The kind of killing where people who exist one moment are wiped away in the next and then never heard from again. The kind of killing in which the police may get called, in which there may be an investigation, but only so the right paperwork can be filed before the case is closed, if the case was ever opened. To this day, I can't tell you whether my great uncle Robert Lee Baker ever killed anyone, or whether the stories of his escapades in California and Florida have just become family legend. For much of my life, there's been a disconnect between these stories I've told about Appalachia and the life that I've lived. It's easy to be the folksy storyteller spinning tales about a wild family, but it's much harder when you are about to sit down to meet the person who's been the protagonist in those tales. Robert Lee not only loomed larger than life, but he also came from a different world, one that I was very obviously not a part. As much as I'd hated Gladwell's book and complained about Obama's guns and religion quick, there was a part of me that understood the way people characterized the region because I was always the outsider amongst those others, a stranger in my own land. My home sat in the northernmost part of Appalachia, nestled in a tiny corner of southern Ohio, far from the poverty of places like Clay County, Kentucky. To those from Appalachia, I was not one of them. To those from outside of the region, my accent suggested otherwise. I lived that dichotomy. Worse, I constructed the most superficial stories about my family and its history so that I might more easily pass into new, more sophisticated worlds. Sure, I'd make the annual pilgrimages deep into Ap the Appalachian countryside and take up residence for a few days in the small hollers along the way, but I treated my visits more like an interested tourist or an anthropologist, someone who wanted to get the authentic lay of the land, as if such a thing existed. I did that as a way to ground myself in something that I hoped would be an identity. That is how I justified my trepidation. As I traveled around the U.S. meeting my relatives, I had this deep-seated sense nibbling at my insides that once I entered one of their homes, I would suddenly and obviously find myself out of place. To which I don't mean more sophisticated. I mean just the opposite. While many of my immediate kin had largely come of age in rural areas before scattering across the country, I'd run from that. I did my best to leave that world behind visiting it only in the stories that I heard when I was younger and then passing those along at the cocktail parties of my adulthood. That's the purgatory I found myself in, a liar waiting to be exposed. So I'd like to tell you that I was excited to meet my great uncle Robert Lee, but that wouldn't be the whole story. The truth is I was nervous. A light rain fell as I pulled into the Poppy Trail trailer park, a small 20-lot station that Robert Lee Baker Jr. called home. His son Bob lived in a small white van next to Robert Lee's trailer. Bob's maroon Lincoln Continental, which he bought for $500, sat looking brand new. My father had set up this meeting as I'd felt a bit odd about calling a relative I didn't know. Just go in and tell him your junior's kid, my dad told me, the same as he'd always tell me whenever I'd meet a new relative. That's how things got done in my family. Genealogy means everything. In a world far removed from smartphones, computers, and social networks, the only calling card that mattered was the ability to trace back your relations to a common ancestry. In this case, that was easy. My dad, John Jr., was Robert Lee's sister's kid. That's my Baker family passport. But that wasn't much help at the moment. As I knocked on the door to my great uncle's trailer, a giant dog came tearing out from underneath a makeshift shanty tent. Two plastic tarps pulled over each other and propped up with a few st sticks. I'm a dog lover, but I had to fight leaping on top of the trailer as the waist-high dog came at me. And just about that same time, Dora, the kind woman with uncombed hair, came out of her trailer, making half attempts to calm the dog without paying much notice to me. What is it that you're looking for, she asked. Not how are you, not what are you doing, what are you looking for? 
Maybe that kind of thing slipped past most folks, but I've heard enough stories about the Bakers to know that wasn't an accident. Before I can even answer, she followed up. Robert Lee's at church. In fact, Robert Lee was not at church. He's not the church-going type. I knew this because I just talked to Bob about 45 minutes before as he was leaving church. So I tried the Baker code. I'm Burgie's grandson, Junior's boy. I'm Robert Lee's great nephew. Oh, Dora said without missing a beat, Robert Lee's at the casino. He just left a few minutes ago. Just like that. No explanation, no acknowledgement that she just lied to me. If I was a real baker and the son of Appalachia, she just assumed that I'd get why she wasn't telling a stranger that Robert Lee was off to the casino down in San Jacinto. I was expected to take that without question, which I did. Knowing I now had some time to kill, I decided to take a look around the town. I pulled out of Poppy Trails and drove through Beaumont. For years, it's been one of the many places that this side of my family has called home. I'd heard stories of the tire shop, the trucking, and the odd jobs that my family held down. It's a small town that sits off Highway 10, wedged between Joshua Tree National Park and the Salton Sea if you're driving in from the east. It's 25 miles outside of Palm Springs and Palm Desert, and is stone's throw between Redlands and Riverside, two of the outlying suburbs of Los Angeles. To the north is the Mojave Desert. Everything surrounding Beaumont is dead, desert, or well-to-do. Why my family stopped in Beaumont is a story that neither Robert Lee nor his brother Herbert would ever tell me. Like so many of the stories I hear from my family, it's just what they did. That was that, and don't bother trying to probe for anything else. But <clears throat> Beaumont feels like a way station, which is exactly the kind of town you'd settle in if you were looking to disappear. Lots of cash jobs, lots of ways in and out. And just inside the city limits, there are signs of life. As you approach California 60 West, you enter Old Beaumont, which is populated by welding, steel supplies, and auto body shops. It's the kind of homegrown manual labor I expected to find. Beaumont felt like one of those quintessential American cities of the 20th century, built by people who stopped and didn't have anyone following. It didn't look pretty, it didn't look pristine, but in a place like this, you needed people who could do things. They were people of great value. And if there was one thing that my family could do, it was whatever needed to be done. Bob was hanging his washed clothes on the clothesline outside as a light rain fell. He stopped and walked toward me. He's a hair shorter than me, just about five foot seven inches, with stringy hair that holds its contour when he runs his hands through it. He ducks under the clothes and extends his hands. We'd never met, but in the last few days we talked on the phone a few times. There was no hesitation in his stride. We were kin and that was all that mattered. How you doing, Brad? Good, Bob. We'd barely exchanged those pleasantries before he started sharing details of his life. Well, I just got over losing everything. All my money, my job, my wife, my house. I like to lead a civilized life. And after this year, he said, looking around, this is starting to get to me. That small white van where he lived had a broken front window. It was covered with a cardboard box. And he didn't have enough money to get his own spot. His van was on Robert Lee's lot fact that neither was, non, neither was plussed about. As I looked around, I couldn't help but think back to just a few years before as I sat in my small apartment in Kentucky, retching on the floor, my body convulsing as the alcohol slowly, deliberately, and angrily drained from my system. Days would pass without notice. It wasn't uncommon for me to fall asleep in a living room chair and lose several days to delusions and hallucinations. I'd forget to eat unless my father or one of my friends brought me food. I got it, Bob. I understood his struggle, and I knew, and I knew it before I showed up. We are bakers, and Gladwell may have been right about that part of our legacy. Within moments of shaking Bob's hand, that nibbling voice that was inside me started to fade away. I carried a deep-seated shame. I bought into the idea that my heritage was something less than it was, and I spent a lifetime letting people believe the same. And as I stood with my cousin, I realized there was an honor in our legacy, even if there was a dishonor in our story. And for now, there's going to be plenty of dishonor. My dad and I, we kind of fell out, he said, his voice trailing off. He cares more about his enemies than he could ever care about us. And there's no expense he spared to get his enemies. So, that's all I got for so far Appalachia. But, um... The thing that I have been trying to call, I didn't know any of these people. How many people, how many of you write 
nonfiction. Do I have a fiction crowd in here? So like half. So I tried to write fiction a long time ago, and it turns out David Foster Wallace was wrong. He said that um, the more you get into writing, the more you realize fiction and nonfiction are the same. And they are in some sense, um, because we're, we can only write the things that we see. But if you ask any cop what's the worst way to put back the, together the scene of a crime, he will tell you eyewitness testimony. We are very bad at seeing what's around us. And so that's what David Foster Wallace was talking about when he said, like, the deeper you get into this. But I'm very, very bad at fiction. Um, I, I don't know how to create the kinds of scenarios that exist in life. And so a lot of what I've been doing with my family is sitting down and trying to get them to talk to me about not the, their lives, but about moments. Like, what's the moment that something changed? Jessica will hear all the time in the Invictus Rider, I always say, what's the moment? Take me to the moment when everything changed. Because that's what stories to me are, moments when everything changed. Whether it be um, Dora coming out of the apartment and, or out of her trailer and telling me, like, within 30 seconds, that whole thing was 30 seconds. Um, and it told us, to me, it sort of introduces this idea of Robert Lee and who we are. Because my family, which you will not hear tonight, escaped Kentucky. And I had to wait until many of these people died because they have, there's no statute of limitations on murder. Um, and my family was involved in a feud for which 150 people were killed. Um, and it ended in the 30s, uh, but officially. But the killing didn't stop. And so there are these stories of people disappearing and things like that. So Dora, who was my uncle's girlfriend, because she lived next door in the trailer, um, was very protective. And the Bakers are surrounded by people that are very protective. And so if you all went and tried to ask them those questions, they would tell you, oh, it, that's not us. And so for, and with me, getting them to get to those moments has been really difficult. Because even though I'm part of that family, they don't talk about those things. Because they don't, you can't think in those kinds of terms. Um, nobody ever, and you hear this from people all the time. And when I when I talk to writers or, or when I'm working with writers, and I and I say like, let's because we do nonfiction stuff. Like, what's the thing that's most important to you? The first response I always get is, well, my life's not interesting. Like, there's nothing. I don't. There's no, I got nothing. And I think, well, I don't really know why you want to be a writer. Then, even if you're writing fiction, you're still mining the emotions and the sort of empathetic things that happen in your life. And those empathetic things, the way we understand the world, is through understanding these small moments that happen to us and being able to contextualize those in ways that are outside of who we are. So this book, by and large, um, will walk, it actually ends in 1500 um, in England because my family has been documented all over the country and traveling around for these. So we have written histories of my family that go back 500 years. And there are just these little moments through these like diaries, these like written in calligraphy of people talking about like the moments when things change. And so for me, it's, there's a connection that sort of goes back through these generations. But also being able to understand the, universe, the universal nature of otherness, which I've realized is an academic term, but which we talk about. Like, no, you never feel like you fit in. Like, that's the sort of human condition is that you never really feel like you fit in. And if you walk around all the time and feel like you fit in everywhere, you are probably an asshole. <laughs> because you probably don't fit in everywhere. And so identifying these moments, um, and I can say this as a recovering alcoholic who for 20 years thought I fit in everywhere and everybody was very happy to see me. As it turns out, that was not the case. Um, the moments and things that are in this book and that I try to sort of suss out and pull out are those moments of otherness, that's the tension of stories to me. It's like walking you through those moments of realization that the thing that you thought isn't true anymore. Um, when I was at Berkeley, I got my graduate degree there, Michael, I was Michael Lewis's um, graduate assistant, and he wrote to Blindside and Moneyball, and I wrote a very, he and I did not see eye to eye, he hadn't written these things yet. And um, I wrote a 5,000 word email to him and told him what a piece of shit he was. Uh, which is now a moment that is passed along to incoming graduate students at Berkeley is what not to do in your career. 
Um, so sometimes the moments are good, sometimes the moments are bad. Um, but it's the being able to sort of step outside of those moments and understand them is, is what a lot of the writing that I do is about and what I'm working through. And it's 741 and it's cold. I'm going to read, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read just um, a little.